Good morning. Um, there are quite a few questions, so we'll begin. See how many we can cover. <coughs> First question is, what is the difference between datus and dhammas, if any? In their, the roots, the root of both of these words is the same. That which upholds itself, that which maintains itself. So the root meaning is identical in both words. <clears throat> but when it comes to using these words, putting them into practice, the term datu is a more scientific term, whereas the word dhamma is a more religious or moral term. So the difference is primarily in how they are defined and how they are used, um, which means there's not such a big difference. The second question is, <clears throat> In everyday city life, would there be any real, <clears throat> tangible benefit from the casual study of these laws of such as impermanence, conditionality, not-self, etc.? The principle of e tapajayata, or conditionality, the the interdependency of all things. This law especially can be studied anywhere or everywhere because this law um, governs the entire universe, the entire cosmos is under this law of conditionality, of interdependency. So this can be studied anywhere, whether in the city or outside the city. The laws such as impermanence and not-self or anatta are related to specific situations, specific problems. But still they can be studied both in the forest and in the city. It's not dependent so much on place. But the law of Itapajayada covers everything, and so it can be studied anywhere at any time. So anywhere where the laws of time and space apply, right there the law of Itapajayada, the natural principle of conditionality, can be studied right there and then, whether at home, or in the market, or in the forest. And the laws of impermanence, of insatisfactoriness, unsatisfactoriness, and not-self are included with in the law of Ikapajayata, and therefore are also universal. The next question is, how does Dhamma and the laws of, of Dhamma or nature relate to ecology into one's duty towards the environment? Everything that could be called a, an ecosystem or an ecology is under the laws of nature. The law of nature governs all ecosystems and all ecology. And the law of nature stipulates how things work. For example, if things are done in this way, then our environment will be dirty. But if things are done in this way, our environment will be clean. The law of nature itself just governs how causes and results 
interact. <clears throat> As for our responsibilities or duties regarding the environment, this is something that human beings um, create themselves. And so that's something human beings must discover and decide upon themselves. However, if <clears throat> those responsibilities which human beings decide upon, if they are if they are incorrect according to the law of nature, then the result of those responsibilities will be pain, trouble, and dukkha. However, if those responsibilities are correct in terms of the law of nature, then the results will be well-being, comfort, and peace. So if we speak about the responsibility towards the environment, we should understand that in line with the duty according to natural law, which is the third meaning of the word Dhamma. Evolution seems to have developed greater varieties of individual characteristics <clears throat> that support the concept of self in man than in most other beings. Why therefore fight against natural conditions by trying to eliminate self no matter how noble the cause of peace may be? The thing about self is that whenever the concept of self arises, there is dukkha. There is dukkha right then and there. And then out of that concept of self further arises egoism and selfishness. And so due to the concept of self, one harms both oneself and others. One abuses both oneself and others. Now, one should be careful to discriminate between different levels of understanding and practice. For example, although there may be the concept of self, if it is dealt with correctly, if we practice properly, there will be some benefit in that self and it will not harm others or oneself so much. But if the concept of self arises and we, we deal with it unwisely, then it will be the source of great harm for both oneself and others. So on an ordinary level, we should never forget that self must depend on itself. We must depend on ourselves because there isn't anyone else who can do it for us. So on the beginning level, when getting started, one will still be operating with this concept of self. But on the higher level, the highest level of Dhamma, one sees that any kind of self, no matter how good, how noble, any kind of self is dukkha, that any kind of self is a burden. And so one seeks to eliminate all concepts of self. But on an ordinary level, one is abandoning um, evil and harmful concepts of self and tries to develop a better self, a less troublesome self. But once <clears throat> any feeling or sense of self 
is gone, then all, finish, all problems and difficulties concerning how one must help oneself are finished. One no longer has to be concerned with depending on oneself or helping oneself. For me, a friend is a person I care for, someone I'm attached to, but attachment leads to dukkha. I learned that this week, but without attachment the person would not be a friend for me. So can you explain what friendship is for a Buddhist? If we look at this matter deeply, we'll see that a friend or the friend arises only because there is attachment to self. Because we, if we didn't attach to self, there would be no, no friend. This merely follows the law of Itapajayata, the way causes and conditions lead to new causes and conditions endlessly. <clears throat> because we attach to self, we have certain desires. And so then we, because of these desires, we want someone that is a friend to help us achieve our desires. <clears throat> and this is how out of attaching to self, a friend is born. But if one has no more desires and attachments, then there is no need and there is no, no friend. So this question is basically, however, when one is on the, this more ordinary level of life, where one still has desires and therefore needs friends, it's important to find the kind of friends that can help us to achieve the things we really need to achieve. These are called good friends or kalayanamita. Those friends who help us to realize the most important things in life. So this is basically a moral issue. It's a matter of sila dhamma, of morality, just dealing with ordinary life in the world. It's not an issue of paramatha dhamma or of absolute truth, of supreme truth, the kind that liberates. It's, it's more, this kind of question has to do with life on the beginning level. One should never forget the principle that one must help oneself, that you can only depend on yourself. Therefore, a friend is merely someone who helps us to depend on ourselves more quickly, more easily. But we can never depend on that other person. But a good friend can help us to discover how to depend on ourselves. We should never forget this principle. The Buddha, it's a very important principle of the Buddhas, atahi atanonato, that one must depend on oneself, one must help oneself. No one else can help us. There isn't anyone else we can depend on. Since there is no I, no me, no mine, I know it wasn't really my father who died of cancer or my friend who died of AIDS. And on an intellectual level, I know that everything is impermanent. But what advice do you give to people who are still hurting years after a loved one's death? And how does one get rid of the memories 
which are still so strong of having watched these wonderful people deteriorate. The first response to this question is the same as we've just mentioned, that if there is no attachment to self, there won't be any problems like this. One will not have any difficulties about the way nature takes its course. But once there is a sense of self, when there is a sense of self, then the self will look for people and things that are of use to it, that benefit it. Or the self will feel a desire to be thankful to the people and things that have helped it. And so once there is a sense of self, we, we create this feeling of mind about other things, either the things that we want to get something from or the things that have benefited us. Now this is, once again, the ordinary level of morality. It's just a natural, instinctual morality that beings, that lives will help each other. This is one way that the law of Itapajayada, of conditionality, works. It's just natural that things in nature will help each other. For example, a small chick can help pick the, the ticks off the face of an adult chicken. The, the large chickens can't pick the ticks off of their own faces. There's nothing they can do about them. But they can go up to a small little chick and put their head down and the little chick can pick the tick. Tick are little insects that suck blood. And there are many of them in the forest. The chick, the small, the baby chicken, can pick the ticks off the face of the larger bird. This is just something natural. It's a natural kind of morality. If on this level, animals and people learn to work together properly, we can live without any problems. If we can live without selfishness, then we can live together in ways where we just help each other to deal with worldly situations. Now this natural morality and this instinctual helping of each other just fl follows from the law of Itapajayada through the flow of causes and conditions which makes up nature. And so if someone dies, whether we die or the friend dies, if one understands the law of conditionality, then one will understand death. And instead of creating a problem or dukkha out of it, the death of whoever will be understood as just being thus. The thusness of it will be understood. It'll be seen as just that. That's the way things that's the way things happen. And then there will be no attachment and no dukkha to the situation. So by understanding the law of conditionality of Itapajayada, we can respond wisely to any situation. According to, there is a secret in nature that all dukkha occurs because of ignorance, avicca, and attachment 
upadana. And there's a place in the scriptures where the Buddha recommends to kill, kill the mother and kill the father. The Buddha actually says this, to kill the mother and kill the father. But here, the father is ignorance and the mother is attachment. And so, when we speak on the highest level of Dhamma, it's okay to kill one's mother and father because it's, it's ignorance and attachment which gives birth to this sense of self. And if we kill that ignorance and that attachment, then there is no more self to be creating problems and dukkha. But if we speak in the normal way of morality, if we speak in an ordinary, popular or moralistic religious way, then to say kill one's mother and father is a horrible thing. But in the language of the highest Dhamma, of the Dhamma that liberates, one must kill one's mother and father. There are some sayings or of the Buddha or Buddha Pasita of the Buddha which stupid people cannot understand and that they get these people very, very upset and confused. One of these is the saying that we just mentioned to kill one's mother, to kill one's father, and be an ungrateful person, or be an agatanyu person. There's the word gatanyu, which in the language of morality, the in people language, this word means to be grateful. So in the ordinary meaning of to be an agatanyu person is to be a, an ungrateful person. So some people, when they hear this, to kill one's mother and father and be a very ungrateful person, they think that this is a real criminal teaching. But the Buddha is not speaking in people language. Here he's speaking in the highest Dhamma language. The, the things that give birth to the self are not our biological parents, but merely ignorance and attachment which give rise to the self. But once the self concept is born, then one attaches to this as my mother and that is my father and all that. So the Buddha said to, to get out of dukkha, to escape from dukkha, kill the mother, kill the father, and be an agatanyu person. But in Dhamma language, agatanyu doesn't mean ungrateful. Agata means that which is not made, not formed, not created. So the thing that is unconcocted, unaffected by any cause or conditions. And anyu means to know. So agatanyu here means be one who knows that which cannot be affected or concocted by anything. These words cannot be understood by people who do not understand the language of Dhamma. If we interpret everything in the, the simple language of morality, we will get very confused. When I first repeated these words of the Buddha, I was severely scolded and reviled by many people. 
they called me a liar. They said that the Buddha would never say such a thing as kill one's mother and kill one's father. And so they, they just started getting angry with me right away and didn't even listen to the explanation. So this is, this is a certain kind of problem that exists also. So therefore we ask that you listen very carefully with an open mind until you understand the Dhamma meaning of such words very profoundly. Because there are other sayings like this which are very difficult to understand. There's not just this one, there are many. Of course, the ordinary moralistic Buddhists never talk about these things, but they are there, and with an open mind we can come to understand them. This is a long question, I'll try to get the main point. Buddhism is concerned only with the quenching of dukkha. All other concerns and questions not directly related to that are ultimately unimportant. However, it seems that humanity is spread out along a long road of evolution and it is only those who naturally occupy a position towards the end of that road, namely near to Nibbana, and the realization of not-self, who are naturally, spiritually, and intellectually mature enough to be able to accept, benefit from, and understand such a refined, pure practice and philosophy as Buddhism meaning that all those others further back along the road who are not so spiritually and intellectually mature, who make up the vast bulk of humanity, are not capable of accepting such a refined religion and could be said that its very refinedness may be the thing that prevents spiritual progress and growth on a simpler level. Therefore, can it be said that Buddhism especially Theravada Buddhism, is a religion that appeals and is directed towards a select majority. And it may explain why, even though Buddhism is the most advanced evolved knowledge of mankind, it remains confined to a small section of the world. Much of what you say is true. The reality which is called Nibbana is not understood easily or without effort in practice. This is very true. In fact, when the Buddha first awakened to dependent origination, to Nibbana, he thought that this, it was so, so difficult and profound that it wasn't worth trying to teach. But later he decided that there would be some people who were capable of understanding what he had discovered, and so he decided to teach. And then the teachings of the Buddha were recorded and passed on. But of course, these are very difficult for many people to understand. And we have to admit that there are people who are still rather stupid who cannot understand these things. And so there are various ways that have been developed to help these people. But at this point, let's be very careful about ourselves. When we say that these, these things are difficult to understand, we don't mean that they are impossible to understand. If they were impossible to understand, then there would be no Buddhism. Although difficult, they can be understood. And so each of us here should not use their difficulty as an excuse to say that I can't understand them, this is too difficult, this is beyond me. 
people who take that attitude are truly stupid, are too stupid to understand the teachings. But the approach of someone who is wiser and more intelligent is to do what is necessary to make oneself capable of understanding these things. Instead of denying the possibility of understanding, instead to, to listen carefully, to reflect deeply, to practice, to put forth effort in order to be able to understand these things. It's not possible to understand them all at once. If you're waiting to be zapped by a magic wand, then you'll be very disappointed. But if you invest some time and effort, you'll get your money's worth. If by making yourself capable you will come to the point where you can understand these things more and more. So this is something important to understand, to take a wise approach to the difficulty of these matters instead of a stupid approach. Now, in fact, Buddhism, in addition to trying to preserve very profound insights into the true nature of things also has developed a number of techniques and practices for people of weaker um, commitment and intelligence. But if you study these, you'll see that some of these later inventions or creations of various teachers still have the same purpose. <laughs> for example, there's a common practice for people who in Thailand are called Asim. These are the old Chinese grandmothers who like to hang around the Chinese temples. And a common practice for them is to chant the words Amitapa. Amitayu, Amitapa, Amitayu. They're told that if they, ch they chant these 80,000 times, that when they die, a special carriage will wait on the roof of their house in order to take them to Nibbana. Now, at first, those who have a understanding of the original teachings of Buddhism will consider this to be rather stupid and superstitious. But if one looks more closely, closely, one can see the, what the, the teacher who thought up this method was trying to do. The purpose was to get these people to say Amitabha Amitayu 80,000 times with, with the understanding that eventually anybody but a real fool would start to wonder, well, what do these words mean? Only a real fool would chant them endlessly without asking and inquiring as to their meaning. The word Amitapa means infinite light, boundless light, immeasurable light, and Amitayu means infinite life, boundless life, immeasurable life. Immeasurable life is that which is eternal, which is a synonym for Nibbana. The same is true for boundless, immeasurable light. So, while chanting this 80,000 times, one has the possibility to start to wonder, well, what does this mean? And this can be the spark for the beginning of an understanding of what Nibbana and Buddhism is really about. So some of these Mahayana practices, which at first may seem rather foolish or, or superstitious, if we look closely until we see the original intention of some of these practices, 
then we will see that they too are designed to lead people towards an understanding of the highest Dhamma. But for people who are on a certain level, they can't get there directly. And so there are some things available to help them to get to a place where they, or a level where they can understand. So it's true that the highest Dhamma teachings are very difficult to understand, but they are not impossible to understand. And we all ought to put some time and effort into getting ourselves ready so that we can understand them. There's no need to automatically consider oneself to be incapable and therefore to give ourselves no chance of realizing the best thing there is to realize in life. Now in Theravada Buddhism such techniques are not used. Theravada Buddhism merely encourages people to think and reflect deeply about dukkha and then to think and reflect into the causes of dukkha to investigate where dukkha comes from to investigate and see that all dukkha comes from ego that without ego there is no dukkha and then to investigate further that this ego merely comes from being stupid about desire. Because of our ignorance, we attach to desire as there being someone who desires. And so the ego is born out of this stupidity about desire. And then investigating, well, why does one desire? Desire happens merely because of ignorance about the feelings, not understanding the, how feelings are merely natural occurrences, one takes them to be real and important and creates desire out of that. And not understanding how the feelings merely come from contact, because the sense organs are always there ready to experience the world and the world is full of things to be contacted, it's just natural that contact will occur. We have these kind of nervous systems in this kind of world, and so contact is natural. Contact happens, and due to contact there are the feelings, or vetana. Because the feelings are not understood, there arises desire. And through even more ignorance, the desire is attached to as being someone who desires. And then ego is born. And due to this ego, there is selfishness. So this is the approach of Theravada Buddhism, to explore dukkha and its causes in this way. This is a very scientific approach. It's systematic, it's rational, it can be investigated and recreated and proven by each of us for ourselves. So this is an approach that is appropriate for our times, for the era when science is highly developed. It's not necessary for us to go to some of the old techniques like for the old Chinese grandmothers we are in these times able to use this scientific approach of investigating dependent origination how dukkha arises due to ego which is a which arises through attachment to the desirer which arises because of desire which comes from ignorance about feelings which arise naturally due to contact exploring dependent origination then is the scientific approach favored by Theravada Buddhism. Since the Buddha's time, many people have tried to find 
various other ways, all kinds of ways to get free of self. There are, there's a great, great variety now of techniques and approaches available. For example, in Tibetan Buddhism, they've got what is called Tantra, or it's often called Tantric Buddhism. They borrowed many techniques from Hinduism and incorporated them into their own form of Buddhism. One large aspect of Tantra involves sex. To, instead of avoiding sex, they engage in sex totally in order to achieve the highest forms of sexual experience. Now, many people misunderstand this and just use it as an indulgence or an excuse to get obsessed with sex. But the purpose, supposedly, the way it's supposed to work, is that through experiencing the highest aspects of sexuality and sexual experience, that one sees how deceitful how elusive it all is, that these experiences and the pleasures that come from them, no matter how powerful or special, deceive the mind, they trick the mind into attachment. And so the purpose is one will recognize that and then transcend all the sexuality and sex and then realize liberation from self. So, if you understand what is supposed to happen, it's a way to get free of the self also. But we don't recommend that you use this approach because it's a very tricky approach and the vast majority of people just get stuck in sex. They get ensnared and trapped in it. Although the majority, many of the people want to think they're able to do it, but most of them get stuck. So we're not recommending this approach. We're just trying to illustrate the principle that since the Buddhist times, many, many forms of practice have been developed to get free of self. We, however, recommend that which has always been, since the very beginning, the central pillar or principle of Buddhism. And this is at the core of all these newer practices and techniques, which is to investigate the reality of dependent origination, to study dependent origination till one sees that the self is just something that originates dependent on other things. And so the self isn't really a self. This is the original way and still the best, safest approach for getting free of self. And when the mind is free of all feelings and thoughts and concepts about self, then there is no way that any dukkha can happen. So don't forget that if it will free us from self, then that's what we're looking for. If it will free it from self, that's what Buddhism is all about. Never forget that the essence of Buddhism is to get free of all thoughts, illusions concerning self, and then one will be free of all dukkha. But some of the approaches, for example, some of these tantric approaches which use sex, or other approaches which involve um, inflicting pain on the body. These approaches are very dangerous. One can get lost in them as well as doing other kinds of harm to oneself and others. And so one must be very careful. You can use whichever approach that you think will work, but understand what working means that it will get us free of self. But we recommend living correctly. The 
the safest approach has always been to to learn how to live correctly in body, our physical actions, in speech, what we say and think, and in mind, which can be summarized simply as living the Noble Eightfold Path. When one lives in the way that's described as the Noble Eightfold Path, then there is no room for self to arise, and so there is no no chance of dukkha. This is the safest approach in the one we recommend to all of you, to live in the way which is called right living or the Noble Eightfold Path. To put this in terms that are most appropriate for people who live in such an age of science as this, we can summarize this correct way of living as to not attach to positive and negative. When things make contact, when sights, sounds, smells, etc. make contact, don't regard them as being positive or negative. If you don't regard them as positive and negative, you won't attach to them. And then this won't be the cause of ego selfishness and dukkha. To put it in words that a child can understand, we can say the the positive pulls us in and the negative pushes out. The positive pulls in, the negative pushes out. So don't let anything pull you in or push you out and then you will be free. An important law of nature is the law of evolution. Let me add, this is according to modern science. It's not been absolutely proven. During evolution, only those individuals were able to survive and to give their genes to the next generation who were highly selfish and who had a strong desire to sexuality and good food and who were able to learn from the past and to think about the future. Thus, the development of dukkha is inseparable with, is inseparably related with the development of the human mind. Dukkha is a natural part of it. Without dukkha, no human mind. According to the law of evolution, the quenching of dukkha means quenching of a natural part of the mind. The law of evolution says dukkha is in line with nature. Buddhism says dukkha is not in line with nature. That is a misunderstanding. Do you deny the law of evolution as a law coining the nature of mind? We can respond to this quite simply and briefly. There isn't just one evolution, but there are many, many lines of evolution, the vast majority of which have failed, which have ended in extinction or death. These are all forms of evolution which are incorrect. But that kind of evolution or that line of evolution which has survived is that which is correct. The incorrect lines of evolution have failed due to their incorrectness. And it's only the correct line of evolution which succeeds and leads to true survival. And it does so because of its correctness. Now, isn't it better to follow the correct line of evolution so that the evolution of life leads to no dukkha. The implication here is if one is still experiencing dukkha, one has not yet followed the highest line of evolution, and one is not really surviving. If one looks at dukkha, it's hard to call that survival. 
So Buddhism is asking, isn't it better to follow the correct line of evolution so that there is no dukkha? If to live correctly, to evolve correctly, is to live without any attachment to life, without any sense of self or ego in life. And then everything will be correct. By removing the self and ego, everything is correct. And then this form of evolution will lead to true survival of the fittest. The correct form of evolution can be called survival of the fittest. But to be really fit, one must be free of self, free of ego. So we don't stress sex or the material, sensual things that support sex and sexuality. We don't stress these the way modern society does because they easily become excessive. And when these things become excessive or incorrect, out of balance, then they become the basis and the object of all forms of all kinds of egoism and selfishness. And so all the wars that have troubled humanity arise in the end because of this imbalance or excess of, of sexuality, sex, and um, materialism. Because of this obsession with sensual pleasure in sex and in luxuries, all the wars and the vast majority of tragedies that humans have inflicted upon themselves are due to this excess due to this imbalance. So instead we stress a correctness where although sex, there might be sex, it's not excessive, it's not out of place, out of balance. It's dealt with correctly and wisely. There will be material things, but they're not excessive, they don't become an obsession like they have for most of the world now. And then when these kind of material things and sex and the, the like are in proper balance and are not excessive but are sufficient, then we don't have the kind of problems with selfishness which creates the wars and the crimes and the exploitation and the destruction of the environment and all these other things. So. Any kind of evolution which leads to excess or imbalance, and we can see many forms of these in the modern world, is not the correctness of true survival of the fittest. The true survival of the fittest is, is truly correct, and there's nothing excessive, there's nothing out of balance. This leads to this will bring about the highest evolution of the human mind, <coughs> of human life. To put it briefly, the positiveness and negativeness which cannot be controlled has tremendous power over us and has no benefit whatsoever. But the positive and negativeness which can be controlled has no power over us and has and has benefit for us. Can you explain the difference between the science of religion and other sciences related to the mind such as psychology, psychiatry, neurology? Talking about the spiritual aspect of nature, how would you define the word spiritual. First, let's consider what is meant by science. For us, when we speak of science, we mean that which can be proven, 
directly through our own experience, that which can be investigated, experienced, and proven directly, where we don't have to rely on logic or belief or anything like that. Which, by the way, much of what is called science nowadays is cannot be proven. It's deducted using logic. But for us, science can be directly experienced and proven through our direct experience. And other people can recreate those experiences for themselves, thus proving it for themselves. So this is what we mean by science. The science of religion is science of the mind. Much of the science that we're familiar with nowadays is merely material or physical science. Even a lot of psychology deals much more with chemicals and neurons than with mental things. So most of modern science is material in dealing with physical things, which is pretty much outside the scope of religious science or the science of religion because science of religion is interested in mental or spiritual things. When we say this religious science or especially Buddhism is concerned with mental things, we mean problems for the mind, those things which are problems and therefore painful for the mind, which of course means dukkha. So religious science is the science which leads to an understanding of this, these mental problems and then a way of ending or solving the problems. Take for example modern psychology. This can come in two basic forms. There's a certain kind of psychology in the world that is used, although it deals with mental things, is primarily for the purpose of tricking people. Billions of dollars of research are poured into a kind of psychology which is just used to deceive people, whether through propaganda or brainwashing or advertising in other related fields. Although this could be called a science of the mind, it's in no ways religious because it has no intention to help people. It's just deceiving and taking advantage of people. But another kind of psychology deals also with the mind, but it has the intention of helping people to, to end their mental problems. So any any psychology which helps the mind to develop further in order to have control over itself. Any kind of psychology that leads to self-control or even further elimination of the self. This, this is a kind of, this could be considered religious science. So we could talk of spiritual psychology which leads to the to freedom from self. And then there's the ordinary worldly psychology, which instead of helping people to control themselves, is used instead to control, manipulate, and exploit people. So this is the primary difference between what we could call religious science and um, worldly science. Worldly science is often material and then worldly science especially is used to take advantage of people instead of to help them. So in the end the word spiritual simply means to deal with the most profound and important problem of the mind which is the problem of the dukkha created by attachment to self. So spiritual simply means the realm of attachment to self and getting free of attachment to self.
The same person asks one more question. In order to know and understand nature and to practice correctly in line with nature, one can either go into the forest and learn your method of realizing Dhamma or go into the laboratory investigating the law of nature and, nature and our duty by doing research. A. What do you think about the later approach? <clears throat> in brief, we need both approaches for studying physical things as well as psychic phenomena the laboratory is better for dealing with things that are purely material or just purely mental phenomena psychic phenomena the laboratory is best but for studying spiritual things the forest is best in order to unveil the secrets of life scientists must destroy life by using animals in experiments for example problems like AIDS can only be solved if one understands the immune system fully since we cannot use humans we have to study the immune system in animals what do you think about this problem do you think it's inappropriate to kill a few animals to save many human life let me point out that the questioner is very biased and in fact loading assumptions it's not a few animals to save many human lives it's killing many animals to sometimes save many human lives sometimes only a few and sometimes just to make nice cosmetics for to make women smell good there's an important principle to be understood which is not a Buddhist principle but it's a principle important in all religions it's a fundamental Buddhist principle or I'm sorry a fundamental religious principle which is that to kill with selfishness to kill animals selfishly that is with ignorance with anger with hatred with greed and so on is considered evil or in some religions it's called sinful to kill selfishly is evil or sinful this is a universal religious principle however and that applies in the laboratory as well as elsewhere however if if um, there is the same kind of activity going on but the motivation is not selfish it, if, it, if it isn't motivated by ignorance greed anger hatred and so on then we don't call that killing if it's done with true mindfulness and understanding or wisdom we don't call it killing and we don't say that it is evil or sinful for example if there is truly necessary research and it is done with wise motives with valid reasons and there's nothing selfish involved we don't call that killing or sinful so what what it comes down to is is it being done selfishly just for the benefit of a few or of oneself for example to make a name in the scientific community or so on or is it being done unselfishly for the the common benefit for the benefit of the majority or of all this is the deciding factor whether it's done selfishly or with mindfulness and wisdom so the basic principle is that to cause something or someone to die if it is done with selfishness that is called killing but if to do something which causes something to die but it is done without selfishness but with genuine understanding then that is not called killing for example abortion if abortion is done selfishly that is killing or murder 
But if there are proper reasons for the abortion, then that is not considered killing or murder. I then asked if, if we use this principle as far as doing experiments on animals, well, wouldn't the same principle ex apply to doing experiments on human beings? Because it's just a choice of our societies that we choose to experiment on animals, but it's considered immoral to experiment on human beings. We could choose to experiment on neither or on both also. And Tanajan responded in basically the same way. To cause something to die through selfish intention, through selfish motivation, is called killing. But if there's no selfishness, just wisdom, genuine intelligence, then it's not called killing. For example, an executioner, if according to the, the constitution and laws of a country, if a person has been condemned to death by the courts, and according to the laws of that society, the person is condemned to death, then there is one person called the executioner whose duty it is to carry out the laws of that society. That is not called killing, it is merely called doing one's duty. Another example is um, Another example, he gave three, let me think of the other. Another one is when farmers plow their fields, whether the rice farmer in Thailand or the corn farmer in America or the wheat farmer in Russia. When the farmer plows his or her fields, many animals will, be, will die. That's just, that's inevitable. Now, if the intention is wise without greed, anger, and delusion, then that is not considered killing. It's just doing the duty. Farmers have to plant the food in order for people to eat. So the farmer is just doing his or her duty and not killing. And another example is if you fire, if you shoot a gun, in self-defense and as a result someone dies that is not considered killing if one is merely protecting oneself defending oneself then one is actually doing one's duty correctly so to cause death and to kill are not the same thing to kill is to cause something to die with selfish intention. But if to cause the death of something for a higher purpose, if the purpose is merely selfish, that's called killing. But if there is a higher purpose, then it is not called killing. So don't think that these two things are the same. To cause death and to kill are not the same. So, this speak, we've, we've used over two hours. The speaker is out of energy, and the listeners probably don't have much energy left either, so we'll close today's meeting. I pointed out that there are many questions left, and he said to save them for next year. Next month. <laughs> which he then changed to next month. <laughs> so, that's all. <laughs>